You know, as I was reading this week, it's funny because when, when, when I have Bible study or I'm reading something and I get really excited about it, and I don't have a sermon for a month, it's tough. Because I want to share it right then and there. And my poor mother sometimes, she, she gets the brunt of it because I'll have Bible study at 9 or 10 o'clock at night here. And by the time I call her on the East Coast, it's 3 or 4 in the morning. But I'm so excited about this biblical truth that I want to share it. And, and I call my mom the first thing. And, and she's always very sweet. She's like, honey, how are you doing? I'm like, well, did I didn't wake you up, Mom, did I? She's like, no, no. And I know I, know I did. But I read this about maybe about three weeks ago, and I was so excited, and I couldn't wait for it for this week to share it. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about Elijah, one of my favorite prophets. And if you guys would turn to 1 Kings 19, 1 Kings 19, we're actually going to read a lot of scripture today, so just, just bear with us here. Just give me an amen when you're there. 1 Kings 19. go ahead and start off with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for your mercy. We want to thank you that we're here together, gathered today to worship you and your Sabbath, Father, that you prepared for us. Fathers, we read your word and we share today. Let it be your words and your Holy Spirit that guides us in your truth, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. So 1 King 19. Is everybody there? Okay. And Ahab told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went into the strength that he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains, and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return to your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also you shall not or you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, and Abel, Mahola. You shall anoint his prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, 
all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Have you ever wondered why God asks rhetorical questions? Why an all-knowing God, an omniscient, omnipotent God, would ask something he already knows the answer to? And as I read the story, he asked Elijah twice, what are you doing here, Elijah? And anyone who has children or grandchildren know what those rhetorical questions are like. You hear what sounds like a car crash somewhere in the house. What are you doing? Nothing. What? I just heard something crash and break. What happened? Oh, we were just playing. What were you playing with? And then you find out it takes you like, what, eight times, ten times to actually get to the bottom of what they were doing and what actually happened? And so when we ask our kids questions and they don't answer us right away, we're trying to get to the bottom of it, right? And sometimes it's frustrating. But I've noticed in the Bible that God asks rhetorical questions a lot. God asks questions he already knows the answers to. And there's a reason behind it. There's a reason behind God asking the questions. And it depends on the situation why God asks the questions he does. And so if you would turn to me to Genesis 3, we're just going to read verses 8 and 9. We have our first question. Where are you? That's simple enough, right? So Genesis 3, 8 and 9. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? Now we know from studies that, from spirit of prophecy, that God was not asking Adam, Where are you? Because God didn't know. It wasn't like me looking for Noah saying, Hey, buddy, where are you at? And I'm looking around, I'm looking underneath the couch, I'm wherever I can find him. Is he in the bathroom? Is he in, is in his room? God knew where Adam was at. So why did he ask the question, where are you? He wanted Adam to know where he was at. What are you doing cowering behind a bush, behind a tree? Why are you afraid of me? I brought you nothing but love. I created this wonderful Garden of Eden. Why are you afraid of me all of a sudden? So God asked this rhetorical question, not because God needed to know the answer, but because Adam needed to know the answer. And Adam didn't realize where he was at and realized his fallen state. The second question I found that was interesting is in Luke 9.20. And this is the Lord speaking to the disciples. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. Now Jesus is asking a question. He knows who He is. He knows He's the Son of God. He knows He's the Christ. And so he's asking his disciples, again, a rhetorical question. And so why is he asking them this question? I think the most important answer had to come from Peter, because Peter was going to be the rock of the church. He was going to be the foundation. So Peter's the one that offered up, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And so Jesus needed Peter to answer that question in front of the other disciples. It was a confession. It's like you proclaiming Christ in front of your friends or in front of your church or in front of your community. It's like saying, I know that you are the Son of God. So that was question number two. Question number three we found in our text already in 1 Kings 19.9. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So you know, when I was looking up a little bit about Elijah, his history, and what he had been through up to this point. I found some interesting things about Elijah. The first thing is, is that in Hebrew, his name actually means, My God is Yahweh. What a name. My God is Yahweh. If someone names you that, your child that, you're expecting great things of them, right? If you, if you name your child something that means, My God is Yahweh, you're expecting them to grow up and honor the Lord, right? The second interesting point I found about Elijah was he was the first, he had the first recorded resurrection in the Bible. So when he resurrected the, the, uh, the widow's son, that was the first resurrection in the Bible. The first recorded one. 
So here he was, the first prophet of any kind to actually resurrect someone from the dead. And in 1 Kings 18, we know that he had victory over Baal's prophets. So here is Elijah, a mighty prophet of God, who's called pretty much from birth to honor the Lord, has a great victory, stands before the prophets of Baal in front of all of Israel who hates him, all the prophets who are saying there is no God, our God is real, and he has all of the Israelites that want nothing to do with him. The king has already turned, he worships Baal, and he stands before all these people and he performs a miracle. He asks God to rain fire down. And if you know the story, the Baal prophets, they cut themselves in, 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 in anguish because they couldn't get their God, their false God, to actually light the fire. And so Elijah, when it's all said and done, not only shows that God is the God, the real God, but he executes the prophets of Baal. He calls the people and says, okay, we know they're not the real deal. Let's execute these folks. And so Elijah is not a wimpy guy. A man who, who gathers up false prophets and executes them is not a wimpy person. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine God calling one of us to go to a, a church or mosque or a temple or another church and saying, okay, I want you to execute the whole congregation. Right? That's a tough task. That is not an easy thing to do. So we know that Elijah is not, he, he, is, a man, he is a man of honor. And he's also a man that is not, you know, we, we always picture the, the prophets and, and Jesus as kind of wimpy guys and a little more, you know, subdued and stuff. Elijah's not that kind of guy. John the Baptist, we know, was another form of Elijah. He was a very manly man. You know, he, he didn't wear, you know, he wore, you know, camel uh, fur or whatever for a belt. I mean, the guy was just, he was a dude, right, as we, as we say. And so here is Elijah, one of only two men to ever... Go straight to God, straight to heaven. And so we have Elijah here that's a mighty prophet of God that has just had a wonderful victory over the prophets of Baal. And he's seen God deliver Israel and turn back. And now he's on the run. He's afraid. And so the question is, God asked him, what are you doing here? And I want to break this down into three parts and three things I want to share this morning. The first thing is, don't let discouragement lead you to danger. Don't let discouragement lead you to danger. The second thing is, don't let your circumstances control your worship. And the third thing is, don't let your eyes close your heart. The first thing is, don't let discouragement lead you to danger. How many of you here have been discouraged? Discouraged. Now, you guys might think this is trivial, but Marius, you'll appreciate this. So in my high school, in, in, when I was 17 or 18, I was the leading scorer on the basketball team. And we were playing our state rival. I had the ball with five seconds left. We're down by one. All I have to do is hit a shot. We win the game. I'm the hero. Drive down to the basket. Miss the shot. I get fouled. I got two free throws. I got two chances to tie the game. I missed both free throws. Last one comes off the rim. I get the rebound. I've got a little jump shot just two feet away. I missed the shot. Three chances. At that point, I was discouraged. Very discouraged. Called my girlfriend at the time, broke up with her, and said, you deserve better. I was so bummed out. I mean, I was literally almost in tears. And the only thing that saved me that night was the coach came in and said, boys, you got another game. you got to play for fifth place. And let me tell you, I was possessed that, that second game. <laughs> I left nothing up to chance. But I remember feeling so discouraged, and that may seem trivial, but to a 16 or 17-year-old kid, that is a very big deal. <laughs> to miss it in front of the whole crowd, your whole school, every, all the weight is on you, and you miss it. And I was so down and literally almost in tears. And I typically don't cry unless the Yankees lose. So it's a, it's a rare event. So, But the point is, is that I, was, I, was, I remember feeling so discouraged. And that was the first time in my life that I felt like I wanted to quit. You know what I mean? Like I felt like I, I just, you know what, just forget this. I'm out. In Matthew 26, 
36 through 39. It says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further, or farther, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We see sometimes when you get discouraged what happens. You typically want to quit. You want to give up. You want to throw in the towel. You don't want to do it anymore. It's so overbearing, so overwhelming. You feel like the odds are against you. And here we have Christ, the Son of God, feeling discouraged, feeling weak. You know, I've read this story many times about Jesus in Gethsemane. And I, and I honestly believe that the, cross, the battle for the cross was won here and not necessarily at the cross itself. Because Christ here could have given up. But if you notice what he said, he says, Not as I will, but as you will. But the disciples weren't anywhere near. They were sleeping. And sometimes, you know, when I read the story, I think, well, well, did Christ really need their companionship? Did He want their strength and encouragement? Or did He want them to get encouraged? Because we see what happens after the Gethsemane when they were sleeping. They all fell away. Instead of being in prayer and, and, and honestly agonizing before God like Jesus was, they struggled. And they fell asleep and they didn't pray and they didn't prepare. And what happened? They got discouraged. They saw their Master brutally murdered on a cross. And they fled and they scattered because they were afraid. And that's what discouragement does, is it leads us to danger. It leads us in the opposite place of where God needs us to be. And the disciples found that out. And as in the story with Elijah, he is obviously very discouraged. But you know, the cool thing about the story is, is for instance, when Adam was asked, where are you? God was upset with Adam, and rightfully so. But in the story of Elijah, Elijah's in a place he shouldn't be, doing things he shouldn't be doing, away from the task that God had handled, handed to him. That's to preach the gospel to Israel. And yet God sends an angel to tend to him. And God leads him up to the mountain to have a talk with him. So even sometimes when we're discouraged and we run away from the task God has given us, God still tends to us. He still watches after us. He still talks to us. So don't let your discouragement lead you to danger. The second thing is, do not let your circumstances control your worship. Job 1, 20 and 21 says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and cried out to God? doesn't say that. Did he complain that he lost everything? No, it doesn't say that. It says he fell to the ground and worshipped. Now can you imagine that? Losing everything you've ever had, your family, your kids, your job, your wealth, your house, everything. I don't know about you, but I would probably be in tears. I'd probably be on the ground saying, God, why? Why have you done this to me? Have, have I offended you? Have I sinned? But what's, what's Job do? He gets on the ground and worships. Praise the Lord! I lost everything. That's all right. He says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. When I read that, that blows my mind. I get it cold and I'm whining to God. My boss was mean to me yesterday. I'm whining to God. Why? Why did He make me do so much work? <laughs> but here's Job worshiping. Worshiping. Saying thank you. Amazing. You know, my wife and I, we watched a story of a man, and I can't remember his name. If somebody remembers, please tell me. He and his wife were actually in Eastern Europe. And they were called by God to start giving Bible studies. And this was during the time of World War II. The Nazis had just taken over. And so they actually 
go to the Nazis, and they've got German soldiers, Nazis, that they're having Bible studies with. And when World War II ended, the communist Russians came in. They're giving Bible studies to the Russians. So the Russians arrest the man and put him in jail, and the woman in a, in a work camp. And so the man talks about his cell and how he was in there 23 hours a day. And he said, it's this drab, damp, wet cell. It smelled terrible, as you can imagine. And he says, he's in his cell one night and he's getting discouraged and he prays to God and says, God, I need you. I need you here in this cell with me. He says he felt the presence of the Lord come upon him as if God himself, Jesus, came down and put his arm around him and said, I'm with you in this cell. He said the cell lit up. He said it glowed. He goes, it, it looked like diamonds and sparkling gold. And he said from then on, that cell was a place of worship. It was a beautiful place. And what's even more amazing is he goes on to tell. He was getting a beating one day, his regular beatings. He's hanging upside down as the guard's beating him. And the guard asked him, how can, you, how can you follow this God of yours? And the man says, my God wants me to love you even though you're beating me. What does your God want? That Russian soldier converted and ended up in the cell next to him. How's that for love? So here he was in terrible circumstances. Could have easily complained to God. God, why am I here? What have I done? I've done everything you've asked me to do. I brought Nazis to Jesus. I brought communists to Jesus. I brought my fellow church people to Jesus. Why am I here? But he worshiped instead. And God transformed that cell into a place of worship. And those Russian soldiers saw that. And many were converted because of that. What a wonderful testimony. So finally, don't let your eyes close your heart. One of the hardest things as human beings, because we are so visually driven, is to look around us at things that are, that we see, and not realize that God is behind the scenes working. If we look at our world today, when I look on, you know, sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes Facebook can be a blessing and sometimes it can be a curse. There's times I love Facebook. I see a, a great verse or somebody sharing someone who got baptized or someone's had a baby or, you know, I enjoy it. And other times somebody posts some terrible news story. And I'll check Facebook in the morning. I'm like, why did I check that? I don't want to see that before I start my day. I don't want to see these terrible things in the world. But all around us we see the terrible things that are happening in the world. And it's hard for us not to be discouraged as Christians. It's hard for us not to look at it and say, where is God? Where is God with this ISIS thing? Where is God with Ebola? Where is God with all these things that are going on in the world? Why hasn't He intervened? But sometimes our eyes deceive us. In fact, most times they do. So here is Elijah in a cave 40 days away from where he's supposed to be. And God asked him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So I'm going to paraphrase what Elijah was really trying to say to God. He says, God, I have done everything you've asked me to do. Everything. I have had great victories. I have proven the prophets of Baal wrong. I have accused the king of turning against your word. Now I'm lonely, I'm afraid, and I'm discouraged. No one listens. Everyone has turned from you. You might as well go ahead and kill me. And so what was God really asking Elijah? And I'll submit to you today that God was not asking Elijah in a rhetorical manner, trying to get Elijah to realize where he was at. Elijah knew where he was at. God led him up to the mountain of God so that Elijah would open his heart to God. God wanted to hear what Elijah had to say. It's a confession of sorts. He wanted Elijah to say, I am lonely and afraid. I don't know what else to do. They won't listen. God wanted to hear that Elijah was broken. 
that he was discouraged, that he was down, that he wanted to give up. Because if we look back in the Garden of Eden, God rebuked Adam and Eve after his question. Because they were in a place they shouldn't have been and they had sinned against God. But in this case, he wanted Elijah to open up his heart. Because until Elijah opened his heart and told God what was really on his, on his mind and in his heart, he couldn't encourage or strengthen Elijah. And that's the lesson I want to take today, is that God needs us to open up to Him. God needs us to give Him all our hopes and our dreams, our discouragements. God wants us to say, I feel like quitting today. I don't want to go into work. I don't want to deal with this. God needs to hear that. He needs us to be honest with Him. Because God knows anyways. He knows our heart. Because once we're at a place of honesty, when we can say, God, I don't know if I can, then God can say, I will help you. Until we get to that point, it is very hard for Him to assist us. And the fact of the matter is, friends, is that we are coming to a time when we are all going to be Elijah's. We are a minority in this world. A vast minority. The world is increasingly crazier. It's crazy. I don't watch the news anymore. It is absolutely crazy. The things that go on in this world. The blasphemy that goes on in God's name. The things that people do in God's name that has nothing to do with God. And so we increasingly are going to be more Elijah-like. That we're going to feel like giving up. We're going to feel like, you know what? They're not listening. They don't want to hear about the law of God. They don't want to hear the health message. They don't want to hear about a Jesus that saves. They don't care about this stuff anymore. All they care about is TV. All they care about is the things they lust after and the things to buy and things like that. But yet here we are before God. And God just wants us to open up to Him tonight. Just to say, God, here's what I think. Here's what I feel. Help me. I know I struggle with this sometimes. You know, I think for the most part men are probably maybe struggling in this area more than, than women. It's because we're very prideful as men. We want to take it on our own. We want to do it ourselves. And so for Elijah, the man, the prophet of God that had seen so many victories, that had done so many wonderful things in God's name, that had stood up against everybody, was alone in a cave saying, I'm scared. But it's okay, he was in good company. Christ was afraid too. So were the disciples. So have many prophets before him. Stephen, Paul, everybody. And so when we have that cave moment when God leads us to a place where he says, what are you doing here? Our response should be, open my heart. Open my eyes to what you are doing, God. And you know what? He did that. Because at the very end of the, the scripture we read, he said, I have 7,000 that have not bowed to Baal. 7,000. So what's he telling Elijah? You are not alone. I've got more. You just go back to doing what I ask you to do, and I've got it covered. So to sum it up, this whole story was about strengthening and encouraging a very discouraged Elijah. That's all it was about. Is God saying, I know you're about ready to give in. I know you're about ready to quit. I know that you're lonely. I know that you're scared. Let's go have a time for a talk. Let me send my angel. He'll feed you. He'll take care of you. You come up and we'll have a little talk. And when you leave, you will be ready to do what I ask you to do. And friends, that's what God wants to do with us today. He is ready to equip us to do the task that He asks us to do. And when we get discouraged or afraid or any of those things, just take time with God. Pick up your Bible and say, God, you know, I've had a rough day. I don't know if I can handle this particular thing. I need your help. Or God, I have a, I have a friend or a family member. They don't want to hear about the gospel. They don't want to hear about you. Help me. Help me, help me to say something to them that will win them over. Or Father, our world's crazy. Our country is increasingly more ungodlike. What can I do in my community to make a difference? What can I say or what kind of ministry can I do that they'll listen, that they'll hear your health message, they'll hear that you're a loving, forgiving God? 
And the thing is, friends, God is faithful. He is faithful all the time. He is ready and willing to help us. And this story is an example of a loving, intimate God that cares individually for each of us and that will strengthen and encourage each and every one of us to spread the good news. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank You for Your blessings. We want to thank You for Your encouragement, Father, that, that Father, no matter how bad things get, that we can come to You and say, Father, we can't handle it. But we know You can. And Father, I would just ask today that not that You wouldn't keep us from being discouraged, but when we do get discouraged, that we seek You, Father, that we go to that cave and we listen to Your voice. And we listen for your voice. And Father, we, we let you strengthen and encourage us so we can go back and do the work that you've asked us to do. And Father, I just ask that you continue to bless our Sabbath. In your name we pray. Amen.